Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the new Lumix G9 on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi, it's Doug Kay, and I'm here with Mr. Camera Labs, Gordon Lang. How are you, Gordon? I'm very good, Doug. How are you? Good, good. Looks like you got an interesting camera there in your hands. What have we got today? This is Panasonic's Lumix G9, which is their flagship stills camera. Uh, just as a brief kind of overview of it, it's a micro four thirds camera, like all of the other Lumix G products. It shoots 20 megapixel stills at up to 20 frames per second with autofocus and in RAW. It films 4K video up to 60p. It has twin SD slots and a weatherproof body with built-in stabilization, fully articulated touchscreen, and a giant electronic viewfinder. Have I whetted your appetite? Yeah, it sounds like it'd be worth many thousands of dollars. <laughs> well, we'll find out in just one second. This is a three-part video that we're going to do here. This is our in-depth video. If you're thinking, hey, I just want a five-minute overview, is it possible for you to do that, Gordon? Yes, it is. I have a first-looks video of this camera that uh, you're very welcome to have a look at if you just want those headline features in the shortest possible time. But if you really want to find out everything about this camera, stick around for this part one and part two and three, and we'll tell you everything you need to know. And the first thing we need to know, Doug K, is how much does this camera cost? Drum roll, please. The Lumix G9 here in the United States retails for sixteen ninety eight. Let's call it seventeen hundred dollars. That's 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 the body only. Okay, so this ranks it as you know a kind of what what the industry would call a semi pro camera. I mean, obviously it's for professional enthusiast use. It's it's kind of at the upper end of the cameras that have got less than full frame sensors. Um, now, I have got it mounted here with the Leica 12-60 to f2.8-4 lens. This is a really, really nice general purpose lens. And like all micro four thirds systems, the field of view is effectively reduced by two times. So this becomes a 24 to 120 lens, a very flexible range. It's not a cheap lens. They also do a 12-60 to Lumix G version. That's, uh, that's cheaper if you may be looking at a different body. But let's uh, compare this to its closest rivals. Now, from Panasonic itself, there's the GH5, which came out about a year earlier. So how much for GH5? That's $300 less, tipping the scale just under $2,000. Okay, so just to kind of differentiate those two products, I'm going to be discussing a lot of the differences between them during these videos. But Panasonic describes them both as flagship models. It's now not uncommon for a camera company to have more than one flagship body for different needs. So Panasonic describes the GH5 as its ultimate hybrid movies and still camera. The G9, meanwhile, is its ultimate stills camera. It's its flagship stills camera. Uh, so now let's look at another high-end Micro Four Thirds body, the Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. How much is that body, please? Yeah, that one, we're, we're getting interesting here because that one's just $100 more than the G9 at $1799 here in the United States. And that body's been out for a year now hasn't it so its price has settled down there's a possibility that the panasonic body may well it's not it's hopefully not going to become more expensive over time hopefully the stay the same will become a bit more affordable so it's already undercutting a body uh, this brand new camera is undercutting a body that is already a year old so that's quite interesting now panasonic uh, also have also identified the fujifilm xt2 as one of their major rivals how much for an xt2 body well, if you went to the F- X-T2, which of course is an APS-C, slightly larger sensor camera, comes in $200 less expensive than this at $1499. Now, the interesting thing about the X-T2, and we've discussed this in detail in our reviews of that camera, is that the body alone of the X-T2 is kind of like, I don't know, 80% of what that camera's potential offers. And if you really want to get the longer recording times and the faster burst shooting, you need to add the vertical uh, power boost to grip, which adds, I, know, I think, two or $300 more to it, which brings it to roughly the same ballpark as the Panasonic and Olympus. So these three mirrorless cameras are all, or four if you count the GH5, are all kind of in the same ballpark, just under, you know, not much change left from uh, two grand really, are they? No, no, it's very, very close. And uh, it's interesting. I'm very curious to hear the differentiation between this and the GH5 in particular. And of course, the EM1 Mark II. Yeah, we're going to mention them all as we go along. I mean, if you have a look at the uh, the the G9 body, if you're listening to the podcast, you do take some time to head on over to cameras.com to have a look at the pictures of this and some more detail. It shares a lot of design DNA with the GH5. That's not surprising, you know, coming from the same company. But Panasonic's made a number of kind of tweaks and adjustments to it that, that make the camera actually look quite different. When you've got them side by side, you'll see a lot of the buttons are in the same places. And you can think, oh, yeah, obviously they've kind of shared 
quite a few components or ideas, but the style actually looks quite different. First of all, you've got this uh, different kind of viewfinder head on on the G9. They've, they've put this kind of ridge that goes down the front of it. That gives it a really different kind of mood. It's almost like having a different a different hairdo in a way. The uh, mode dial, which on the GH5 is on the upper right hand side, has now moved to the upper left hand side i'm not sure if you can see i'm going to show you there it's got a red ring around it now we know from canon that a little red ring around their lenses means this is a good thing panasonic are now saying that if they've got a little red ring around their modal it denotes a flagship model obviously uh, the gh5 doesn't have that because it predates that maybe they'll sell a a new mode dial that you can stick on top of it with a red ring around it. So the mode dial now sits atop the drive mode dial on the G9, whereas on the GH5, it's on the other side. That, of course, means you now have a completely blank surface on the upper right-hand side of the G9. Oh, my God. What, what, what will they do with that extra space? Oh, look at that, will you? Well, have a look at that. That is a upper LCD status screen, something that's very common on DSLRs at this price point, but something that's a rarity. In fact... Can you think of any mirrorless camera that has an upper LCD status screen? A mirrorless note reminds me of my old Nikons, but I got to tell you, upside down, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, you don't you don't get to see it, but upside down, it looks like it spells Delhi, D E L I. I'm ready for lunch. Shell oil. Do you remember those days on the calculator? Now, anyway, I you know this is all of my good Nikons had these things on the top, and I really miss them. I think it's a great addition. Yeah, and as you can see, if I just twist the uh, the power collar there around the shutter release you can backlight it which is again something you would expect uh, on a dslr of this class as well so that's that's nice and it does give you a lot of information at a glance and it also i noticed i ran down the battery completely on this last night and uh, the main lcd screen wouldn't come on the viewfinder wouldn't come on as you would expect but this screen at the top did come on and said hey you know i'm still alive i've not broken it's just that the battery has run out so you need to do something about that so you know because they consume so little power i always liked the way that on nikon cameras even when it was switched off it told you how many frames you had uh, remaining on that so that's quite unique that they have got this um if we move on to the grip compared to the gh5 you'll notice the profile is a bit different the grip section kind of goes above the uh the, the flat surface behind it and it gives it again a kind of really different style it's only a few millimeters high but it really looks different i think from the gh5 the grip itself feels fantastic it's very reminiscent to me of a Nikon grip, a high-end Nikon grip. It's got a really nice, fine textured rubber surface, but it's got this kind of hooked inner area for your fingertips that allows you to really hold it confidently and securely. So I think they've kind of been a little inspired by Nikon there. But on the other hand, they've been inspired by Canon, dare I say, on the shutter release. This, to me, feels like a, a shutter release that has been inspired by maybe a 1DX. It's a completely soft touch shutter release. So there's no click as you push it down. It's more of a squish. Now, the interesting thing about this, and it's not just me, it's almost anybody who picks this camera up. The first time you pick it up and try and do a half press, you'll fire off a ton of pictures because it has got one of the lightest shutter releases I've ever used. It's extremely sensitive. First time I picked up this camera, I thought, oh, no, this is going to be a disaster. But it's amazing how quickly the human body adapts, even mine in my aging years. And you get used to it after about a day or two days. So I don't think it's an issue at all. But be aware that the first time you do pick up the G9, you'll think, crumbs this shutter release is absolutely mad and um, so overall you know they've they've i'd say panasonic's put a lot of work into the ergonomics here if we have a look at the back you'll see there's an af joystick lever here this for me is one of the things that actually fails slightly because maybe my thumbs are not very long but it's quite a way over when you're holding the camera you've got to stretch a bit with your thumb to reach that but it's a personal thing maybe i've got small thumbs although i should point out that if you're using the uh, optional battery grip, I'm just going to demonstrate this by holding the battery grip like this. You can see that my thumb naturally rests over the uh, AF joystick on the back of the battery grip. That is positioned perfectly. But on the actual camera body, if I grip it there, you'll see that my thumb, oh, if I twist around, you can see my thumb is positioned more for this uh, autofocus mode collar and that I have to stretch beyond it to reach the AF joystick. Tiny little things you notice when you, you're really using these things day in, day out. But overall, I'm very satisfied with the, the style and the controls on this. Doug, what do you think of the way it looks? Does it look familiar? Is it, is it a, a Lumix pro Does it look like a Lumix camera to you? Well, a couple of comments on that. First of all, on battery grips. 
Uh, one of the most important things for me when I use a pro camera with a battery grip is that it feels exactly the same no matter which orientation I place it in. I want to be able to turn it one way or the other and not have to change my fingers. So that's a bit of a miss on this. This camera looks really big. And I, what's interesting is when you're hold, just because you're holding it, it's close to the camera. But yet when you consider the fact that you don't have, you know, giant sized hands, Gordon, it, you realize you're holding it with your fingertips, not your full grip hand. So it's actually a small camera. It doesn't look like a normal Lumix camera to me. It looks uh, larger and darker <laughs> more serious it, it it does it looks different it looks different um, and it feels really good i mean i said it a couple of minutes ago i'll say it again it does feel really really nice in your hands and I, i've had quite a few comments on some other videos from from dslr and they're saying you know i love the feature sets of these mirrorless cams but i'm concerned about how they're going to feel in my hands you know they're too small and the answer is that um they're getting bigger at the at the higher end this this camera is still smaller than a comparably priced dslr but size is only one thing of it. Actual build quality and how it feels in your hands is another one. And I think that in terms of solidity, the way the body feels in your hands and the construction, they're, they're kind of on a par now at this class. It's not like I think a lot of DSLR owners look at a mirrorless camera like this and they think it's going to feel like a, you know, a Canon Digital Rebel or something, like an entry level DSLR. It doesn't. You know, it might be the, uh, smaller than their DSLR, but it feels very similar in your hands because the build quality is similar. And it is fully weather sealed, this camera. It's, it's pretty tough. I've had it in the drizzle. No problems. There's plenty of customization too. I mean, I counted 19 buttons. Some of those are soft keys on the touchscreen that you can customize. There's some neat things on it. There's a there's a new little uh, dial just to the corner of the uh, lens mount here that you can use to switch between certain banks of settings. I've got mine configured to switch it into night mode, where it basically does red text on a black background on the screen and through the viewfinder, so it doesn't destroy your night vision. Then just flick it back when you don't need that. But again, there's loads of different ways you can customize that. Um, I want to move on quickly to the uh, the viewfinder because this really is a highlight of uh, using this camera it's a quad vga oled panel uh, just like the gh5 before it, and it, that's becoming a trend on higher end mirrorless cameras the a7r mark III from sony also has that resolution and i mean that's um that that's I think it's 1280 pixels compared to 1080, sorry, compared to 1024 pixels wide. It gives a really detailed view. But the thing that makes this viewfinder different from the rest is the magnification. Um, it has a magnification of 0.83 times. Now, most high-end mirrorless cameras have got a viewfinder magnification of about 0 0.77, 0 0.78 times. And some of the budget ones are down to 0 0.7 times. This is 0 0.83 times. And I'm going to show you a video that I filmed through the viewfinder that actually lets you cycle through those three different magnifications because Panasonic's recognized that maybe this image is too big for some people. So there's a button on the side of the viewfinder head you can press and that cycles through these views. You can see that I'm cycling through here on the video between the 0 0.7 times. So that's like a entry level mirrorless camera, 0 0.77 times, which is pretty much everyone else. And 0 0.83 times that is that bit bigger still. I mean, the, these viewfinders are huge now compared to an even an expensive DSLR. I mean, Doug, do you like shoot, uh, composing electronically through the, view, through the viewfinder? I'm a complete convert. I love it. Sure, absolutely. I wonder if the reduced angle is to benefit people who wear glasses. I wonder if that's the purpose of it. Do you think? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely, because depending on the kind of eye relief, uh, you know, and how far away you're holding the camera, you may not see the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, it can be a bit, it's a bit like when you go and see an IMAX movie, you not see a proper IMAX movie, you not see one for a while and you sit in the middle or worse, a bit closer to the front and you're like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm the person who's going to have to close my eyes. It's too scary. So it might be a bit like that. You know, you can shrink it down if it's... Anyway, I loved having that big view. And again, one, for me, one of the best things about electronic composition through the viewfinder is you can play images back. Zoom in on them. It's a very high-resolution panel, as I mentioned, so you can really check your detail and your focusing. I love being able to do that. And of course, being able to compose and play back movies through the viewfinder. So that is a real treat. Underneath it, we've got a three-inch fully articulated touchscreen. Again, we've talked about these before on other Panasonic Lumix reviews. Panasonic's got one of the best touch interfaces around, so you can not just tap to reposition your AF area, but you can also tap your way through all the menus. You can you can even drag guidelines, live histograms, all of that sort of stuff. So that's, that's good news. I'm going to move now swiftly onto some connectivity here and look at the ports on the side. If I open this flap, on the side, you'll see the first 
port flap has got full size HDMI and a full size USB 3 port there. Now, this is interesting because the GH5 had a USB C shaped port, and that was a year ago. And so a year later, the G9 has gone to a kind of slightly more old fashioned port. And I, I can't quite get to the bottom of that. Now, this is the first Lumix G camera that you can charge over USB, but you don't need this shape port to charge. Um, so I'm not sure how they've done it. And while I'm on that point, I'm just going to show you the charger. I don't know, it's a bit unusual, isn't it? Here is uh, here is the charger, and you can see that it's you know it's obviously a kind of a, a USB device here. But the cable that comes with it is is one of these USB mini plugs uh, to go into the the charger here. And you think, well, that, why didn't they why didn't they either put a USB three port on this, or, or a USB mini port on that, so that you know you'd I don't need to you know have another cable. I got caught out uh, by that the other day. I was shooting, uh, I was up in London for the day, and I was shooting, and I, my battery ran out, and I thought, no problem. I'll just use my uh, USB battery pack. And I reached into my bag, and of course, I didn't have a USB 3 cable. I needed one of these with me, mm -hmm. and I didn't have it. So I won't get caught out by that again, but that's something something to be aware of. Um, if you watched my first looks video, you'll have been impressed that I mentioned that this USB port can also be used to power the camera like a Sony mirrorless. It can't, it turns out. That was information that I got incorrect. It is just for charging. But at least you can now charge this camera over USB. Above that, we've got a headphone jack, and above that, we've got a microphone input. The microphone input considerately stays out of the way of the fully articulated screen, so it doesn't get in the way. If you've got a microphone connected, that screen is not going to get in the way of it. We've also got a PC sync port. We've got a remote jack here, and if I open the grip side, we have got twin memory card slots. Shouldn't be a surprise because most cameras of this class do, but you'll like this, Doug. They are both UHS-2 speed compatible. They will both exploit full speed UHS class two cards. You pleased to see that? Hooray. Hallelujah. <laughs> Finally, somebody, somebody who gets it right. Yeah. And I did test this. I never take this sort of thing for granted. So I did some, uh, burst timings, ti uh, counted the maximum number of frames and also timed the, uh, the time it took to flush the buffer. And it was exactly the same on both card slots. So There's no compromise switching from slot one to slot two. You can select these uh, slots up to either do relay recording, where as soon as one card's full, it switches to the other one automatically. You can set it to backup, where it records exactly the same things to both of them. Although I should note, doing so did reduce the total number of frames that I could capture in a burst. It's still lots. It's not an issue, but interestingly, it was different. Um, or you can set it up to record one type of media to one card and one to the other. And that's fully configurable. You could do RAWs, JPEGs, 4K, 6K photo files or movies. And you can decide which of those four formats you want on either card. So that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, the battery is also very powerful. This is the same battery or slightly modified version of the one that you got on the GH5. Panasonic rate this at about 400 shots. But I think that's a little bit um, pessimistic, actually. I was getting quite a few hundred more than that, typically per charge. I took this camera on safari uh, with me to South Africa, and you can see an article I wrote about that at CameraLabs.com if you're interested. And it performed very, very well. And I was shooting large bursts, not just with the electronic shutter, but with the mechanical as well. And I was getting, you know, typically about a thousand shots per charge with that. I also ran down a fully charged battery in the movie mode, and I got just under two and a half hours of 4k video and that's without overheating the camera just got kind of barely warm so i reckon that battery's pretty good um i mean doug that was always a big issue with mirrorless cameras wasn't it for, especially coming from a dslr they said oh the battery's rubbish but i feel the, the companies are really addressing that now yeah i mean i got used to carrying two and even three batteries with me but now they've addressed the problem as you said and this latest generation seems to have got enough battery capacity to keep you going for a day yeah, definitely. I should also add that I had when I was testing the G9, I had Bluetooth enabled all the time. This camera has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. No NFC, though. You don't need it with Bluetooth. It pairs with your, your phone. And in this instance, like a lot of other cameras, you can use it to uh, automatically embed your images with uh, GPS coordinates as you shoot, which works really, really well. It's completely seamless. So a lot of my pictures, sample images that you'll see at cameralabs.com have got location coordinates tagged. Just a quick aside, here's a really interesting thing. I found out on Safari, they actually ask you to switch that feature off if you go on Safari and to switch your phone off as well, because there you'll be posting a picture of a rhino um, with its exact position. And you probably tagged it. Look at this lovely rhino. And unfortunately, that's actually used by poachers. I didn't realize that's a horrible 
horrible uh, part of society that we have at the moment, but um, or for a long time. So if you are uh, into geotagging, don't do it if you if you go to one of these uh, safari parks. But it does work when you're outside of there. Hey, on that note, Gordon, I think it's time to go to part two. It is. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, we're going to stop this video now. If you were listening to the podcast, just keep listening. We won't go away. In part two of the video, we're going to look at autofocus and overall handling. And in part three, we're going to look at image and video quality and give the camera an overall wrap up. So come back, check out part two. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and like us. See you in a minute.